Asking the question, what is the gospel, can sometimes be a can of worms when you're talking with Christians. This is a basic question uh, that we might think everybody knows, but it may be hard for any Christian to encapsulate into a single phrase, try to grab from all over the place. You know, how often are we asked, what is the gospel? The answer, can, uh, the answer that people give can have many good elements, but wind up being a nothing sandwich to the listener who might not have any sort of Christian upbringing. One example uh, is of a radio interview of a Christian artist coming out with a new album who was asked, and part of their album was about the gospel. They were asked, well, what is the gospel? Well, of course, you would expect someone signed to a Christian label, releasing a Christian album uh, that's going to fill the Christian bookshelves and be played over Christian uh, ra- radio waves would know the answer to that, right? Well, a bit unprepared, this is what the artist responded with. What a great question. <laughs> it's a good way to start and buy yourself time. I guess, <laughs> I guess I'd probably... Um, my instinct is to say that it's Jesus coming, living, dying, being resurrected, and his inauguration, the already and the not yet of all things being restored to himself, and that happening by way of himself, and being made right of all things. The process of both being and being a reality in the lives and hearts of believers and yet a day coming when it will be more fully realized. But the good news, the gospel, the speaking of good news, I would say in the news of the kingdom coming, the inauguration of his kingdom coming. That's my instinct. (laughs) You could tell they may have been taken off guard and, and, and did their best to come up with something that sounded right. And I'm sure every one of us would do the same. I don't know if many of us would fare well uh, when we're asked the same questions or asked the same question. What about if we have some time to think about it? If I gave everybody a card and said, write down what the gospel is. You could do that on your pamphlet if you want to. But... Uh, what if we have some time to think about it? You know, someone was asked on a discussion forum uh, with plenty of time to think about the response, and this is what they said. My understanding of Jesus' message is that he teaches us to live in the reality of God's now, of God, now, here, and today. It's almost as if Jesus just keeps saying, change your life, live this way. Now, this second example has shreds that might resemble the gospel, but it ends up sounding very therapeutic in making a decision to make a change in your life. And I've actually sat through gospel presentations where people say, are you ready to make a change to change your life? To what? From what? Where are we going? What is this all about? You know, it sounds an an awful lot like Manifest Destiny, or making a change that has nothing to do with God, has nothing to do with Jesus, has nothing to do with the Bible altogether. Yes, it's fascinating for us to observe that churches with a cross atop their building can sometimes miss the cross altogether. And that's our direction this morning, is we don't want to miss the cross You know, these are common phrases and simplifications of the profound truth of Scripture. As we are in part three of our Find Your Place series, we have heard about our adoption into the family of Christ and what that means for us and all of the inheritance that comes with that. Last week, we looked at our place um, in the mission to make disciples and to know there's two commands to make, Jesus tells his Uh, disciples to go and make disciples and then to look to him. But our trajectory this morning is a communion service as we remember Christ's perfect sacrifice for sin and the gospel that brought us there. 
You know, I was a communications major, and in any message, there's a sender, there's a message, and there's a receiver. And as a communications major, we can geek out about all of these things. But today we're talking about that message. The sender, and we are the receiver. How do we receive this message? This week in Finding Your Place, the most outrageous part of the gospel, get this, is that it's not about you. Okay? God is the gospel. Write that down. Remember that. That God is the gospel. And I want us to see this this morning. There are multiple times the effect of Christ's works, work is encapsulated in the New Testament. And 1 Peter 3.18 is a perfect example of how much it's not about us. Will you read with me? 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now, when we look at that and we look at 1 Peter 3.18, it's a, it's a nugget, it's an encapsulation of the gospel from 1 Peter. But we see where it starts and we see where it ends, that it's not about you, it's about God. God is at the center of the gospel and we get to be a part of it. For Christ also suffered once for sins. So Christ inaugurated this. Christ started this. The righteous for the unrighteous. Wait, that's how we get in there. That's where we show up. We show up as the unrighteous. But then it hits us right in the heart that he might bring us to God. It's not that we reach up to God, but it's that God came down to us, that he reached into the deep darkness of this world and has pulled us out and has clean, cleaned us off and has made us alive with that last part, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is that we are dead to the flesh as Christ on the cross, was dead to the flesh. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to live for the gospel that we are made alive by his spirit. I love how Ephesians 2 puts that same idea that you were dead in your trespasses in sin in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the spirit of the air. This was our preset. But God has made us alive in Christ. You know, I was challenged this week to encapsulate the gospel. <laughs> that might be a fun thing for you to do, to, to, to sit down with all your friends or sit down alone and encapsulate the gospel. And this is what I came up. The gospel is the good news of God's love, bringing salvation to sinners who find forgiveness through the work of Jesus. That's powerful. That's a, good, it's a pretty good definition, that the gospel is good news. That's what the word gospel means. I think it's important if you're going to use a word, use the definition, right? But bring salvation. We're lost. That's our preset. And we're brought into the family of Christ and finds forgiveness, that God has extended forgiveness to us to bring us from death to life. You know, the foundation of the Christian life is not only something that we know intellectually, it's an experience. The good news is not just a dump of knowledge about the attributes of God. We're not just filling ourselves up with facts about God. You know, there's three pieces, and we're, we're going to talk about facts and how facts are important, but there are three pieces that are essential to the gospel but are seemingly backwards from what we see in our world. So the first one is the historical person of Christ. The historical person of Christ. 
The gospel basis is not about you or any sort of achievement. It's rooted in history. A reporter doesn't report on advice. No, that's not news. So if you turn on the news and they're giving you advice, that's not news, that's advice. The good news, the gospel, is something that is done. It's based on a historical person of Christ and the grace of God. If someone is giving a gospel message and makes no effort to connect to the historical person of who Jesus is, if there is no mention of the life of Christ in the gospel, I would tell you, run. (laughs) They are missing the core of what the gospel really is. The miracles, the teaching, the resume, the resurrection of Jesus is important. If we sidestep those things, then we miss the gospel. There's an established dependency on the grace of God if those things really happen. You know, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 says, if Christ is not raised, our preaching is what? Useless. That's important for us to understand this morning, is that if it's not rooted in a historical fact, then it's useless. If if we neglect the historical fact that Christ went to the cross and that he raised from the dead, it's useless. It's not by works, not by your righteousness, not by uh, what you have done. You are not saved by the teaching of the founders. You are saved by Christ. You know, it's interesting comparing Christianity with every other religion, just about every other religion has a thing that you must do. You must follow this thing. You must follow the five pillars. You must follow the teaching or complete this task. But Christianity is very different, that it is what Christ has done for you. Why? Because we are saved by grace. The grace of God. Might I challenge you? Check out this history. You know, we have a month and a half before the end of the year. You know, we've been talking about the Gospels. I encourage you to read through the Gospels before the end of the year. It's amazing what we might pick up. It's amazing what, might we, what, what we might understand. About last week we talked about looking at the Gospels that help us with making disciples. We make disciples the same way Jesus made disciples. But this week, if we look at the Gospels, there we find the historical account of Christ. Piece number two. The surrendered life brings a new identity. That's an essential part of the Gospel, but it's seemingly backwards from what we see in our world. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it this way. If you ask somebody if they are a Christian and they say, well, I'm trying, it means that they don't know what it means to be a Christian. A surrendered life has a new identity and your sins are covered or they're not. This is not just a second chance at things. We are adopted into a family, given a new name, given an inheritance. Our debt is is paid through what Christ has done on the cross. You know, it's interesting, as humans, we don't like to surrender. Not many of us like to put up the white flag. We don't like to give up. If we are in a battle and we are going to raise a white flag, we are giving up to the other side and are completely at their mercy for whatever they want from us. But it's very different when we surrender to God. Surrendering to God is something completely different altogether. We know who he is, and he loves us, and he knows what, and we know what he has done because of what we've seen in Scripture. I trust him with my life because I know he knew who I was long before I know. I knew who I was. God knew me before I even knew who I was. Surrender requires some abstract thinking. It doesn't always make sense from the onset, but we look at what surrendered life 
and how that new life changes the way that we think. You know, the abstract thinking of we are dying to live and we're living to die, that might be a hard thing to get our minds around. But Romans 12 contains the phrase living sacrifice, which, which might be a foreign concept from the outside. But what a living sacrifice is, is that we are dead to sin, we are alive to Christ, and that we are continuing to live, but we're dead to ourselves. And the third piece that's essential to the gospel that might seem backwards to our world is the new kingdom living with a gospel lens. Now, I have a little object lesson because what does a lens really do? Our default is that we are brought into the world with a muddied lens. We have a broken lens and a lens and a camera affects everything that is seen through the viewfinder. How does a lens work? When you look through it, it makes clear what's in front of you. The grace of God shown to us shows how, just, how, just how much it's not our doing that makes us saved. Getting a kingdom perspective shows us just how big God is and how small we are. Having the gospel as our lens, having the good news changes the way that we look at everything. The lens of the gospel brings us to life and it shows us the spiritual reality that's in our world. That's what a lens does. It gives us a new perspective. It gives us a perspective on everything in our world. You know, many people get stuck looking at God through a microscope. You know, I think of a microscope versus a telescope, and they look at God through a microscope. We come into this world with the distorted lens of what God is and who we are. But an honest and accurate view of what the gospel is, is this. That the gospel is the cargo of the Christian life. You know, it's interesting. We carry the most precious cargo on the face of the earth. Have you thought about that? I've got to get this lens back on, sorry. We carry the, the most precious cargo on the face of the earth. The good news, the salvation that is available to everyone who believes. I love how Isaiah 55 puts it, where it says, Come, you who have no money. Come, you who have nothing. Come and drink. Salvation is available to everybody and it's free of cost, but it's the cargo of the Christian life. It's nothing that we buy. It's nothing that we can earn. It's only by the gift of God, by the grace of God. It's the cargo of the Christian life. You know, I I, I consider the gospel in my life as something that I am a broken vessel. I am one that is imperfect. Just you know how how imperfect you are. I know how imperfect I am. I know the holes that my ship has that take on water. I know the imperfections that I have, but Christ fills every one of those. And the cargo, the good news, is what we are taking to this world. We talked about the mission last week and that cargo, that's what the Christian life looks like. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives a great example of what this is from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on that stand and give light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
When we carry that cargo, when we carry that light, when we carry the gospel, the good news, it changes everything in our lives. And it changes the people that we interact with. That it's not just us giving glory to God, it's it's other people giving glory to God. That they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. That's what it looks like to live out the gospel. Now, when we come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, there's two major ways that we celebrate the gospel. The first one is the renewing of our minds. If you look at Romans 12, 1 through 2, some of us may have this memorized, but Paul is saying to the Roman church, therefore, brothers. Now, every time we come to a therefore, it's important for us to wonder why the therefore is therefore. (laughs) Essentially, leading up to this point, in chapter 11, he's talking about the Jews that have, been, that have come to faith in Christ, but also the Gentiles that have been grafted into the tree of Christ. And how we have come to this knowledge, we've come to this family, we've come to this truth. And that we are a family. Romans 12, Therefore, in view of God's mercy... What is God's mercy? It's the, it's the gamut of the Old Testament. What has God done for us? He's done so many things. In view of God's mercy, the greatest example of God's mercy is him sending his son. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer by the pattern of this world, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We celebrate the gospel when we renew our minds, when we spend time in God's word, when we come to a deeper understanding. And I know it's a battle because our flesh is pulling us one way and we want to pursue the spirit in another way. We renew our minds by the word of God. We renew our minds by celebrating the gospel. The second way that we celebrate the gospel is remembering his sacrifice. And that's what we're doing today. When we approach the cup and the bread, what Christ has done for us, we remember this thing. We never graduate from the gospel, but we come back to it again and again and again. We never outgrow our need for the gospel the good news that saves us is the same good news that, that, that saves and is available to everyone. I don't know every problem every person here is facing. I don't know what your week has been. But knowing the freedom and forgiveness we have in Christ helps us to endure. And it's the most intimate thing that we can do as a church is to come to the table and celebrate communion, celebrate what Christ has done, the sustaining work of the gospel. You know, there's an example in Scripture that I think is really important as we move towards communion, as we move towards this celebration of the gospel. That um, you look at these three aspects that we talked about, the... um, in the New Testament, and you will find them. But in 1 Corinthians 15, we see the gospel and the work of Christ come together like nowhere else in the New Testament. And I love 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, because it makes it crystal clear for us what the gospel does. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4 says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as if of first importance what I have received, 
that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the, with the scriptures. That's what we believe in. That's the truth that transforms us. That is where the gospel and the work of Christ come together. Now, as we move towards communion, I want to encourage us today. The gospel and the Christian life is not just for spectators. It's not just a dump of knowledge, something to fill our brains with. It's not just a good book to read. But the gospel is life. The good news of Jesus Christ. Paul's telling them that that's what he preached to them. And you received, and it's on which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Let us search our hearts today. We're going to take a moment here just to search our hearts. Confess what we need to confess as we come to the table. Because 1 Corinthians is very clear that if we do this in an unworthy manner, we're drinking condemnation on ourselves. I think verse 3 is also very important. For I delivered to you as first importance of what I also received. The gospel is of first importance in our lives. Let us examine our lives And if there's anything that we have done that is not worthy of the gospel, let us confess it and turn from it and receive the forgiveness that was purchased by his blood. Let's take a moment now in the quietness of your own heart.